Hello, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About It. We're here to destigmatize childhood sexual crimes and investigate stories of incest. Many people don't want to talk about this. We do. Today, I have with me Latarsha Houghton. She's written a book called Breaking the Silence. After 30 years of silence, she came out and told her story. That's not an easy thing to do. I'm so excited that she's here, and this will be a fascinating story of father-daughter incest. I also come through that. And so I like to start these, Latarsha, with asking you what your motivation is to be here. Um, people don't understand why we tell our stories, although they get to tell their stories all the time. So if you would just tell us a little bit about, you do so much um, in this work, and I'm so honored to be with you, you here today. And I want to thank you for that work that you do. And we'll talk about it at the end of this. But right now, if you could just talk to me about your motivation for all your work around these sexual crimes. When I look around, I see so many hurting women and men. And I used to be that person. And so my heart, the, when Jesus began to change me and started healing me, he just put it in my heart for me to go back and just share what he did for me with them. Because we all need healing. And until we get to a healed place, we bleed on everybody around us because we don't understand and we're frustrated. But we have to go back to that place of the abuse. And a lot of people don't like to go back to that place because it's so painful. But going back to that place brings healing. And as you heal, you begin to heal other people around you. So I would say that the motivation is sharing with people what Jesus did for me. It's awesome. I love it. <laughs> Very succinct. And uh, same exact reason, by the way, that I'm out here as well. So let's bring you bring everyone into your story. Um Everybody, you know, that hasn't read your book, Breaking the Silence, it's a fantastic book. Um, she starts at the beginning. Again, generational trauma has been in her family for a long, long time. So if you could just bring us back into your story and tell us with as much as you're comfortable sharing, but just so that people understand your story and what Breaking the Silence meant for you. Well, Breaking the Silence was, um, as a young child, I went through childhood sexual abuse. Um, it started off with, um, you know, younger family members um, having, um, you know, trying to penetrate me as a little girl, then a female cousin having me doing things with her, which I didn't understand it, you know? And as a kid, you really don't understand these things. You just know that they don't feel right, you know? And then, right. you know, you just believe that you're not supposed to say anything because you blame yourself for these things that happened to you, <laughs> which is not your fault. And then I began to um, be sexually abused and raped by my biological father. And I ended up conceiving a son from that relationship. And I had my son because I felt like that was my escape. Wow. From the right. So ex uh Explain that to me a little bit more, your escape from the abuse by being pregnant, you mean? Meaning, hey, I, I just felt like if I had this child, this child would love me because I was just, I just wanted to be loved by my dad. I just wanted to be loved. So I just did whatever he wanted me to do. And having this child, you know, because I just wanted to be loved and wanted that connection. I just felt like if I had my baby and I could get away from my dad, I would just have real love. Mm, I, right, so I understand. I escaped, you know, and I met a guy. And when I met a guy, I told him I was pregnant and he was liking me. And, you know, I started um, having an affair with him and, you know, started dating him. And I ended up having this child. And, so you know, how old can you tell us how old you were when you're because you were raised by your grandmother isn't that right out to a certain degree so to a was, certain degree I was raised by my grandmother and then my grandmother ended up going into a senior citizen building where children couldn't be there so I ended up going with my father and then ended up going back with my mother and then going back with my father. When I was, I think in a fourth grade, I ended up going back with okay. my father. 
I stayed so, with my father until I was in high school. Gotcha. So you were bounced around with family, which again, you know, these messages that come through that were not worth a whole lot. I mean, I remember in your book, you talking about an aunt who was unkind to you and you always felt that you were in this place of, you know, not being wanted. So at what time did you go back then to your biological father? Um, in a fourth grade. In the so, fourth grade. How, and how old were you? Um, I think I was 10, 10, I think about 10 years old. Okay. Now, and did, did the sexual abuse start then? No, it started when I was about 14. Okay. So 14. And I, I, the only reason I'm going to ask this next question is I think it's so important for people who have come through this to understand the grooming process and what happens. I remember in your story, wasn't there drugs and kind of sex, drugs, rock and roll, uh, you know, around your father's home when you were 14? Can you talk just a little bit about that? Yes. My father did cocaine a lot. Um, ever since I can remember, um, I remember being a little girl and he had gave me a Ziploc bag with some caps of cocaine in it and told me to put it. I had a little rumper on it. He told me to put it on the side of my rumper, like where my panties were, um, put it at, at the tip. And I didn't know what that was at that time. But as I got older, I was like, oh my God, suppose I was just sitting there and I had just put it in my mouth or something like, you know what I'm saying? So I know right. it was God with me all the time protecting me, but yes, I was around cocaine all the time because, you know, I always seen him with the dollar bill with the cocaine and a little straw, he would cut the straw and stuff like that. So um, when I was um, a teenager, he told me to try it. And I looked at him and he said, I want you to try it. He said, you know, I'm teaching you how to be a woman. And I remember him taking me, telling me to take a line. And when I took the line, I just remember my nose running and I kept having like, feel like I had sinuses or something going on. And it just made me like kind of hyper and, you know, but right. I had never, um, you know, tried drugs before or anything like that. So and I just thank God for protecting me from, you know, um, getting hooked on cocaine. And, you know, because once I got away from my father and got away from that situation, you know, I kind of didn't go back to that life because I would look at people and say, I don't want to be like that. Right. You know? Yeah. Once no, I, I completely understand that. So he gives you, he brings you into this world with him. He tells you you're a woman, right? He's grooming you for the next exploitation. Right. And, and of course, praise God that you didn't move into that, which is, right. you know, it's associated with such severe abuse that I'm thankful that those distinctions were clear, but it's been so interesting to me how to destigmatize these crimes, they all work the same. They always make you feel older than you are. They always bring you into these kind of dark secrets with them. So the first thing he does is expose you to this secret world of cocaine, but he hasn't sexually abused you yet. I assume soon after this, probably this grooming, he then moves you into the world where he's now going to take it further. Is that true? Yes. So when he, before he started the cocaine, it was more of, let me, um, let me see your breasts to see if your breast is growing properly. Mm -hmm. And then it was um, trying on negligees because he was doing fashion shows and he wanted to see me in some la lingerie. And from the lingerie, then the cocaine. So yes, the grooming was, mm -hmm. you know, coming, you know, following the steps of him, you know, doing the the lingerie, um, telling me he's going to have these fashion shows and I may need to be in some of these fashion shows. And then he would talk about wow. breast, and I didn't even have any breast. I did, I didn't have right. any breast. Um, I didn't start developing until really late. And then he would um, introduce the cocaine. And then he would start um, making me watch um, nasty movies, um, pornography. Uh, um, it would be all kinds of pornography, sickening. Um, and then he would introduce me to asking me about fantasies and telling me about different fantasies that he had with. And a lot, some of this stuff I didn't even put in the book, but it was, you know, he was talking about the fantasies that he had with 
two women sleeping together in him. So he was baiting me and trying to um, right. lure me into the having sex with another woman and him watching. And he even had another woman to approach me, you know, and I cried and I freaked her out so bad that she didn't even bother me, you know, but he had even had her to come to me one day in my bedroom and naked, <laughs> um, wow me trying to int introduce that to me and then you know it build up into him coming into my room or taking my clothes out of the bathroom when I had to come into the out of the bathroom to go into oh, my bedroom. right he would take all of my stuff out of the bathroom you know and and when I listen to you and I listen to these stories, you think about, they just break down all the barriers that we have. And, you know, of course, your the earlier years where all of this is around your family and the children have most likely been abused and is why, you know, they're doing all these sexual things. But um, these predators look very much the same, but it, it's, you know, it's so sad how they break us down and they bring us into the story and they build this kind of, complicit bond with us. They want us to believe that we want it with, uh, with them. And um, it's just part of that. The story that I really want people to understand is because I don't ever want to hear again in my life. Why didn't you tell? Why didn't you, you know, these things, it's so ridiculous when you find out the, the how they develop and groom the victims before they ever move into the harm that they take and what they do next. So this starts about 14 and how long then before you get pregnant? Um, it goes all the way up until I'm at age 18. Oh, I'm so sorry. Last year high school. I'm so sorry. So at 18, then you get pregnant. And yeah. when do you learn that you're pregnant? What does that feel like? Um, in my last year high school, I started feeling really sick, um, real nauseous in the morning. And I kept saying to myself, what in the world is going on? Why do I feel so sick? And I remember marking my calendar and saying, I didn't come on. And I said, well, maybe um, something is going on wrong. Maybe I'll come on next month. And I didn't come on. And I started getting really sick. I had um, morning sickness so bad. I was headed mm -hmm. morning and night. And I ended up going to the doctors and they said, could you be pregnant? And I was like, no. <laughs> and then they told me I was pregnant. Wow. And so had you had sexual relations with any person other than your father? No. I Not thought that's time. what you'd say. And so at that point, what do you decide to do? I, um, I had this guy who was liking me and at first, I didn't really like him like that. I just liked him as a friend, but I found myself allowing myself to get attached to him. Mm -hmm. And I started going out with him and started going over to his house. And then um, as we got into the relationship, I ended up staying at his house even more. And he was like, you're not going home. You're not going to school. And I said, I don't, I don't feel good. And he said, well, what's wrong? And I said, I don't know. And so I told him I was going to get a pregnancy test and I got a pregnancy test and told him I was pregnant. But he, and he knew this wasn't his baby because you guys. Uh, he, it, he didn't know. Right. Or anything yet. And, right. And yeah, go ahead. I was just, I was already a couple of months and I wasn't showing or anything. And I told him that I was pregnant by him. You know, and in my experience, I didn't get pregnant. My father um, moved to other means so that I wouldn't get pregnant, but I was still being raped before I left his house. And, and I didn't care who happened by Latarsha. I just, the first guy that was nice to me, I was like, get me out of here, you know? So I can relate to that whole, this guy's being nice yeah. and I want to get out of here. So now you're 18 and um, you've become friends with him. You leave your father's house at this time then and decide yes. to keep your, your baby. Yes. Yes. Wow. I mean, I just, you know, I, I know your story. I've read your book and I don't know, it's still just heavy on my heart for those years that you went through. And now all of a sudden you have this child along with you. And I love that you said this is love. And ultimately it does become that, but this is a heavy burden. This is, 
a heavy okay. crime that you're now carrying and you don't talk about this for 30 years, do you? I do not talk about it um, at all. It was wow. very hard. So I suppressed it so deep in my gut that I literally started believing that this man was his father. Like I, because I blocked out everything. And because I blocked out everything, it was almost like I didn't want to remember it. Right. I didn't want to remember. It. I and did. I, I did the very same thing. I didn't have a child, but you know what? I didn't want to remember that, you know, months before I got married to this other man, you know, my father had raped me. I didn't want to remember that. And they call it today trauma amnesia. You know what? I call it a gift to God. I needed to go for a minute. <laughs> I had to go. And you you cannot, to me, it's an intolerance for more, right? What else we what what else are we gonna do? We now have these circumstances that we have to live in. And I don't know, they call it all kinds of things today, but through experience, I just know my mind couldn't tolerate anymore. Does that make sense to you? It makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, you don't want to think about the trauma because right. for me it made me feel guilty. It made me feel like I did something wrong. I lived with shame. Right. You know, and it taunted me. So I just put it so far in the back of my mind. And when you said amnesia, I'm like, um, what, what did you call it just now? Again? It's called trauma amnesia. Yeah, trauma amnesia. Trauma amnesia. I can I can relate to that. Right. I did to remember that you know and who could you tell who could i tell who could you tell that you know if, that if you that, that is exactly what i thought when you were telling the story who are you gonna tell if you had somebody to tell before you wouldn't ended up pregnant we have nobody to tell people don't realize there it's not like all of a sudden the stop sign comes up and says i'm gonna tell somebody you've never told anybody since all of this stuff has been happening to you since you were a child why would you tell now? You know what I mean? Our voice was taken years and years and years before we got to our teen years, right? Right. And when I wrote my book, I had family members that said, well, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell? They had no idea the trauma that you are going through in the midst of that. First of all, you're afraid. Absolutely. You are afraid to tell anybody in the family because if you already have a dad that can do these things to you, you have no idea what else they can do. Oh, amen, sister. That is the truth. Behind We're terrified of them. We are Behind terrified. Doors. Behind closed doors, you have no idea what can happen. And, you know, I remember him saying to me, do you know what this would do to this family? If you told right. somebody, you know, well, I might as well kill myself, you know? And, and, and just, um, you know, intimidating a kid and bullying a kid, you know, and right. they make you afraid that if you tell something bad, is going to happen. So I live with anxiety for years. Oh, hugely. It's, and you know, and, and here's the other complicated thing is, so there's that side of it. The other side they build in us, particularly when there are fathers is this kind of weird, horrific love card kind of thing that it's it's so it's a trauma bond that they create with us not only are we terrified of them but we also somewhere they've made us believe that we're in this kind of love affair with them and and i hate even using that term because we know it's horrific abuse but they've so distorted reality to us that you know i did think my dad loved me i did think that he even though he was horribly abusive, I'd seen him, you know, murder somebody. Weirdly, I always talk about this weird love commingling in there because a child, when we don't know anything else, when nobody's ever been kind to us, when nobody's ever shown us what protection looks like, what mercy looks like, that when you say no, somebody might listen. Right. Because we don't know these things, there's it's it's a love hate mixture and fear. D does that? Can you talk about that at all? Oh, goodness. Yes, I can. <laughs> right? It's complicated. It's very complicated because my dad could do no wrong. Right. I heard about my dad doing things. I remember a cousin saying, you know, you made me suck you off when I was a little girl. 
-hmm. And I was really little, but for some reason that trauma stayed in my mind and I never forgot it. Mm -hmm. And I hated her for saying that about my dad for a long time because I just, my dad could do no wrong in my eyes. I loved my daddy. You know, I thought that, you know, my daddy was the, he was the, the, he was the man, you know, like this is my daddy. You know, I run down the street, you know, I'll leave my tricycle and run down the streets. I'll jump off the step and jump in his arms and he would catch, you know, so you, you have that bond already. But then when this starts happening, how can you turn your love on and off like a light switch? Right. That's a beautiful way to put it. It's very true. You it's your God-given right to love him. Right. And you can't turn it off and on. But these right. emotions, this abuse that's happening, and this is what makes us complicated. And it makes it frustrating because do I start, should I hate him now? Mm -hmm. Should I continue to love him? I have to listen to him because if I don't, there's going to be consequences. So it, it was almost like I had a love hate relationship for him. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I absolutely. It's so complicated. I had a comment on my audio book and a man said, I cannot now, you know, want to be on Jody's side because she should have shot her dad and instead she wants to hug him. <laughs> And you know, Latarsha, you will understand the complication in any father, daughter, incest, or any of those things, mother, son, all of those. And there's a lot of that too. It's incredibly complicated how this love card, it's almost the very last card. My children, unfortunately, were also, I picked an abuser. He, you know, raped my children. And I told them the hardest card you're going to have to play to get free of this guy is the love card, this love that you hold for them because a, a, a child wants to love them. And then they bring you into this secret collusion with them that somehow you're in this secret collusion by your own will. This is not an act of your own will, but they've damaged our mind in the way that we think in such a deceitful, deceptive way that we do feel in cohorts with them somewhere. You know what I mean? And that's the shame. Like you kept a secret for 30 years, Latarsha, 30 years you kept that secret because of the schemes that he played on your soul, on your spirit and on your mind. And this is what I mean when I say to destigmatize these crimes. These children are so blocked and they cannot see the truth that I pray <laughs> That with, with these stories, the telling of these stories, if you're listening and we understand what it feels like to want to love your abuser, to want to hide for your abuser. But the other thing that we understand today is that there is no love with these abusers, none. This is not love. This is 100% from the pit of hell. It is not love and it is hurting you and you have to tell. So Latarsha, now I just, I had to say that because it's so strong and they keep us stuck with this for so much. So these are tools that we use to survive, right? Trauma amnesia, the trauma bonding. We have to learn how to, to, you know, uncoagulate our mind around the lies that have come into it. What other things do we use? For me, um, I used religion when I was young from 18 to Oh, 35. When I was married to the kid's dad, my father was religious. He would do a Bible study in the front and rape me in the back. And so I kind of stayed in his religion. I didn't start drinking until actually I came out and found Jesus and kind of the truth hit me and it was overwhelming to step into the truth. But I was 35 before that started happening. So what other tools did you use? Now your son's born. So you've put your trauma behind or you've blocked it for a minute. It's not behind you, right? Because we carry it with us. So let's say that's stated accurately. But now your son's here. What other tools did you use to make it through that next many years of silence? Well, I would say that sex, I think, became my addiction. Mm. I feel like I would, because I didn't know how to tell men no. Mm-hmm. Right. And I felt like if I had sex with them, that would help them to be drawn closer to me and would love me. And I felt like it, it helped me to be in control. Right. I was, I felt like I was the one in control at, at this point now, like, okay, he was controlling me, but now I'm controlling this situation with sex. 
and I didn't know how to say no. So whenever somebody wanted to sleep with me, I just, you know, would just do it because I didn't know how to say no. I didn't know that I was worthy enough to set boundaries. I didn't realize that I could say, no, I don't want to do that. And, you know, and I'm not going to do it, (laughs) you know? Um, So that was one of the ways that I was coping. I wouldn't say they was tools. I would just say it was coping skills. Right. It's it, right. It's a, it's this, right. It's a coping skill. You know, I used to do that as well. And I always called it, it was like a quick fix. If I was feeling shameful and like unwanted, I'd just go have sex with someone. And for 30 seconds, it made me feel good until I did it again. So I, I completely understand with that. But what other coping things did you use? I think many of us use that, by the way. Yeah. Shopping. Um, mm-hmm. I became very controlling because I felt like I needed to control what was going on around me. Mm-hmm. I also would, um, I started hanging out with friends a lot um, because I didn't know how to deal with my son, but my son looking just like him. Oh. Um, it was like a tormenting uh it was like a tormenting spirit, a spirit that just oh, wanted I to can imagine. And then he had a lot of behavior problems, which I did not realize that huh, I didn't realize that I had no idea what I was getting into by having this child and not understanding how the chromosomes are broken down mm-hmm. with my son now is intellectually disabled. Uh, with neurofibromatosis and a lot of other disorders that came from the incest. Mm -hmm. So now I'm dealing with a son who has a lot of behavior problems that I'm not understanding. I'm still a teenager at this time. I'm frustrated with life, not understanding how to deal with this, getting called up to the schools, having to go up to the schools. And it was just a lot. It was a lot. And so you're now focused on just taking care of him, but you're not focused on all of this could be a result of incest. Not focused, not even thinking about that at all. Right. I had buried that. Right. Because that was something that nobody could ever find out. So right. buried. I'm going to um, neurologists and they're saying, were you doing drugs when you had him? And oh, I'm like, wow. what? no. You know, and that's the first thing they think that because this child is is um have a disability, um, you know, they they automatically think that you're using drugs. And I wasn't using drugs at all. Right. I want to um read this part in your book. If you have not read um Latarsha's book, you should get it and read it, Breaking the Silence. It's a fantastic book. Um, In this chapter about suicide counseling and silence, she writes, um, a 302 is a civil warrant authorized by a physician or police officer, sometimes at the request of a concerned family member or because of one of several incidents to take an individual to the nearest emergency room for immediate psychiatric evaluation. And then she says, the night I walked out of my doctor's office, the police came knocking on my door. Take us to that moment, Latarsha, where now you've blocked it, you have the sun, but clearly all of these blocking coping mechanisms are not working and you've attempted suicide a few times. Is that correct? Yes. Go ahead and talk to us about that. I I was very suicidal. Um but but this is not my story. This is yours. So talk about that, please. Well, it was a time in my life when, um, because I never got healing from the abuse, I started attracting bad relationships because, you know, we attract what we are on the inside, broken. And I was... Um, going through a lot with my ex-husband a lot and um I just got so tired you know I was just tired I was just tired Mm -hmm. of 
just life. Like I just felt like it was just, I was, it was just being dumped on me. Everything was just being dumped. Everything, you know, um, from a bad marriage, from my childhood, going through stuff with my, my son, you know, going through stuff with my daughter. It was just so much. And I remember um, taking some pills one day and had to get rushed to the hospital. And I stayed in ICU for three days. And after I stayed in ICU for three days, I ended up, um, they ended up transferring me over to a mental um, ward. Um, for me, I sat there and I just remember crying and saying, God, it got to be more than life than this. It's got to be more than life than this. And I just remember, you, you ever heard of somebody said, I'm tired of being tired? Yes. I'm sick and tired of being tired yes. as well. I was in such a dark place mm -hmm. because going through that type of trauma is very dark. You know, it's so dark. And even for a person to want to abuse your own child is a very dark place. Yes. And so then the child comes into this dark place with you, you know, and you feel like there's no freedom. Like, when will I ever get out of this vicious cycle of abuse? So as I began to sit there, I just, I, I cried and I just said, God, please, I just need some light at the end of this tunnel. And after I got out of the hospital, God started giving me divine connections for me to get the help that I needed to get to the other side of that pain and that abuse. That's awesome. Before we talk about that, and we certainly will. And again, I just have to stop and say from my heart, <laughs> I love you. And I'm so sorry. You know what? We went through these things and God has made us incredible women, but I still want to say, I'm sorry. Cause you know what? Those years are so hard. You can look at us today and not know those years. Those years are tragic and horrible. And I, I can remember wanting to drive a car. It was the first time I ever had access to anything. Cause my life was so controlled from the time I was born into these parents. I never had any freedom. So when I got in a car, it was the first time I thought I'm going to drive this car a hundred miles an hour and crash into that wall. Cause I didn't have any other access to kill myself. So I understand. And, and the years are dark and we will get into your story in a minute, but I want to go back and talk to you about where was God when you were a child? Where was God when your mom didn't want you? Where was God when your mom and dad both walked out? And where was God when the children were molesting you? Can you talk to us in a very real way about where was he in those years? I was very frustrated, but one of the things, and, and I, I had to go back down memory lane one time. I remember being, um, I remember being in um, elementary school and my mother used to go to church a lot because this is when she had moved back from Detroit, Michigan. And she would take me to church all the time and I would go to church with her and I would come home from church and all of these kids would be sitting outside and on the ground. And I remember looking at them and I would be preaching the word of God, everything that I had learned at church. And they would be sitting like an Indian style and just listening to me. And when I thought back to that time, I was like, wow, God was with me all the time. I remember late at night having to walk from like one aunt's house to another house. And it would be really late at night. And for a kid, like people don't let their kids walk at night like that. Mm -hmm. But I did. But I remember I always felt the presence of God with me for some reason, always. And even in those dark moments, I would remember praying in my mind, saying, God, please don't allow me to, you know, get hurt or don't allow this to happen. But when this situation was happening, it almost felt like there was no God to me. It, it, I don't know, like, I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had stopped praying. I had stopped praying. I wasn't, my mind wasn't going back to those years of me always saying, you know, where God, where are you? You know, please be with me. I feel scared. 
you know, but in this situation, I don't, I, it, it just almost like it went blank for me. Mm -hmm. Wow. In, in the moment, in the moment, but yes. it wasn't until I got through it. When I look back on it, I can see where God was. But it does feel dark. And you said something that's so clear. I, I have a personal belief that this is the best crime Satan has, because when you come to a child before they know anything, and all they know is I could see red slits in my father's eyes. I'm sure both of my parents were demon possessed. People don't like to hear that kind of thing. I'm here to talk the truth, or I might as well just go home. They were both demon possessed. I knew darkness before I knew God. But when I was four years old, Latarsha, I was sitting, I was actually not even four yet. And I was in this house after a rape. And I remember sitting up against the wall and I felt Jesus come to me. I didn't see an apparition. I didn't hear anything audible. I just felt his presence. And I didn't know his name, actually. I didn't know his name until I was eight years old. It's, it's kind of a quite a story. But my mother said, we never took you to church. I don't know how you ever met Jesus. You know what? I met him. But I have to tell you, um, my father met religion. Religion actually needs God. <laughs> God does not need religion. And so yeah. when dad brought religion into the house, my Jesus voice was it, it, the same for you. Like it was just darkness. I remember leaving dad's house when I got married at 18 and looking up to heaven and saying, fuck off. I want nothing to do with you because I was in such confusion about good and evil. So Tell me then, so let's go back into your story where you talk about now I'm I'm leaving the suicide war, watch, I'm leaving this ward, but God puts people in my life. So you kind of have all these years, which is mirrors very much. I understand this so much. So he starts bringing, God starts coming back into your life because now bring us back into your story there. Um. So even after I got away from my father, the person that I was with at the time and told him that he was the father of my my son I talked to him about God a lot and he even got baptized from you know him and I going to church and stuff but again like you said you said a major word was religion and that's what I had learned religion right I Me did too. not really understand Jesus yet right I understood religion you know, read your Bible, go to church, read your Bible, go to right. church. You know, not that spirit from darkness, by the way. <laughs> right. Not understanding how to operate in the Holy Spirit. Right. So you your question to me was you came out of when I came out of the yes. house. Yes. yes. You said people, God started putting people strategically into your life and I brought you to another place. So I just wanted you to come back to that. Cause I thought it was a very good thing that you were going to share with us. Well, so, so when I had, when I was praying at night, I said, God has got to be more than life than this. You know, I've been going to church all my life. I've been reading my Bible, trying to understand the Bible, trying to understand how to be obedient to the Bible and all of these things. And this is what you learn as a kid growing up for some people, you mm -hmm. know, but I, it was the Holy spirit that I didn't understand, right. it was, you know, that, that Jesus moment. Right. Mm -hmm. And he started giving me divine connections. I started hearing him, you know, saying, you know, things will be better. You know, I, he started, I would pray to him and say, God, if, if this is your will for me to get this divorce, please reveal it to me. He revealed it, mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, okay, I'm getting this, you know? And then, um, he gave me a spiritual mom that really, really helped me to learn my true identity in Christ, my That's true awesome. identity. And you said something and I, I definitely want to piggyback over to it. Go right ahead. Okay. When you talked about as a child. The enemy wants to get us at a very young age. He loves yes. to get children at a young age. Yes. This is why it's so important for us to break the generational curses and, yes. up and be that voice and teach our kids 
because if we don't, it will happen from generation to generation. And the enemy is very strategic. He's so strategic that if he gets the child at a young age, as you be begin to get older, you'll still be in that darkness and he's stealing your destiny from you. Everything yes. that God had planned for you, everything that God had in store for you, he is stealing it. But when you break the generational curses, God will double your portion. And people don't understand that we have to break the generational curses. We have to speak up. We It's going to make people in your family feel uncomfortable. It's going to right. make that person feel uncomfortable. But if you are operating in the spirit and you are doing what God is calling you to do, you will be able to stand up for yourself. God will give you a backbone you never thought you had. I did not have a backbone. Yeah, I if, didn't either. It's 10 years ago. I don't believe that I would have been able to stand up to people, especially when they call me and say, well, why did you write that book? Well, why did you put the family stuff out here? Because mm -hmm. I did it because this is what God is calling me to do. Right. Because going through that type of abuse, I had became a people pleaser. I needed yes. everybody's approval. I needed everybody to do these things. And this is how the enemy strategically get in your life to destroy you. He is out to kill, steal, and destroy. He That's wants right us off of our A-game. He doesn't want us doing the things that God has already planned and predestined for us to do. So he's stealing that because he was kicked out of heaven because he had no life. And now he doesn't want us to have a life. Amen, sister. That, that's all I can say. It's so true. And so with that, you know how we fight back is with our voice. And the and the Bible talks a lot about it. I always call Jesus the first freedom fighter that hit this planet. And that's a perfect segue into your story about, so 30 years you're silent. God steps back into your life. Tell me what precipitated you saying this son and myself share the same father. What 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 were the circumstances around that when you finally sure. told? Why are you telling now? Why are you telling this now? How do we know this is true? You get backlash from speaking the truth because people don't want to accept the truth. They rather believe a lie than hear the truth. Oh, it's so true. I don't get that. Because I they think they want to stay in their silence and in their darkness and in their secrets. That's why I, that that's my personal, I think it's a strong, they want you to be quiet. I remember my counselor said, Jody, your family doesn't hate you. They just want you to be quiet. <laughs> right? Because- when you speak truth, you are stirring the pot for them. That's right. That's right. And they don't want to deal with the things that they had, the darkness in the dark places that they were in. Right. Who did you first tell, Latarsha, that your son was your father's? I believe I told Tracy, which is the person who I told him he was the father. Oh, okay. When I started getting into church really heavy and talking about walking in your truth and, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be step free. And so I told him. And when I told him, he said, I already knew. Oh, oh wow. And he wow. said, yeah, we knew, he said, we, um, he said, I, I never wanted to hurt you. He said, and I don't ever want you to change the birth certificate. He said, I am his father. What love? <laughs> I mean, right. Wow. It was God giving me a kiss. I felt, I felt like when I, because I, I had to have the courage to go to him and say this. And I'm just crying, snot crying, and right. you know, sorry. And I'm a Christian now, and I just want to tell the truth, and I don't want to live a lie. And and he just looked at me, and he hugged me, and he said, "I already know." Wow! I just, it was God just giving me a kiss on the cheek. And he took you in, and <laughs> that's it's beautiful. I mean, how beautiful of Tracy to unconditionally accept you and know. 
and help you. And, you know, I do believe in these stories, no matter how dark they are, God always gives us enough to survive, right? Until we can find our voice, find our strength and take our power back from these horrifically evil, dark people. That's, that's really beautiful. And then you, once you tell once it's easier to tell again and again, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it just brings healing to you when you're able to talk it about does. it. I can talk about it without crying. There was a time in my life I could not talk about this without crying. You right. know, the more you talk about it, the more strength you get because you are now taking your power back. Right. It's so true. And through that, unfortunately, we have to be honest, if we're going to tell the whole story, the truth is when you tell a lot of times your family will not stand with you. I um, have lost my family, although I can tell you, the fa I call it the family I came through because I have a family of God. Latarja is my sister and I, I mean yeah. that with all my heart. And so I have family. But um, the other thing that's important to remember is if you bring this family with you, you may likely be harming your own children because these people, when they don't talk about it and don't get healed, can perpetuate this sin, can sexually abused children. I'm not saying that all people are, but you have to be careful about bringing people with you that don't step into healing. Right, Latarsha? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have to, if, if, I mean, to me, I don't feel like I've lost what I've gained. I've gained far more and I, the peace that I have, and I don't drink to where I get drunk and fall down. I can still enjoy wine with dinner, but I've, I've found a freedom through telling that I would have never found, I would have destroyed myself and I would have lost my children. And so the gains by us doing this, I'm telling you for anybody that's listening, you gain so much more. The loss is tremendous. You've heard us talk about a lot of the loss. You know, um, I love this one book I read called The Power of Confession. And it talked about the congruence between the two hemispheres of our brain that begin to speak to one another when we tell a secret that we've never told. So the truth is this actually takes part of even just our mental capacity to deny and withhold. And the more you tell, you actually even get your brain back, which is to me a fascinating thing because it, the, the cost of everything spiritually, physically, a lot of us are ill and we carry diseases and sicknesses with us because our pain is housed in our body. Did you see any of that? Um, you know, I just, I, there were so many releases that I saw when I began to talk. And then when you talk, more stories come forward, you know what I mean? And, and so I stay with those stories because I find more freedom in that. D does that resonate with you? Yes, it does. Yes. Yes. It does. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, it's, it's a uh, remarkable, uh, that we are who we are, Latarsha, coming through what we came through and and that severe childhood trauma that lasts for years and years. I also love people to hear our voices, to look in our eyes and feel the strength that is in our spirits. Because the truth is when you've come through trauma and you're on the other side, you can run circles around people who don't know who they are and are timid and afraid and don't speak the truth. Um, there was this other beautiful part that I actually want to talk about now, because I haven't talked about this on any of these, uh, this series of talks, but one of the things that you talk about in your book that um, I do want to talk to you about is you have a chapter on forgiveness. Forgiveness is a very, um, difficult subject. A lot of people believe that forgiveness is forgetting. Forgiveness is not forgetting. But could you talk to us a little bit about that chapter that you wrote on forgiveness and what that feels like and and how that looked out in your life? Did you go back to your father and did you confront him? Did you uh, forgive him with your voice? What did that look like for you? Oh, <laughs> that's big. So for me, I went back to my dad and I said um I got the courage I was all pumped up and I said I'm gonna go talk to my dad because I'm gonna tell him how I feel right so I get to the house and I said in my heart that I've forgiven him and before I went I said I'm gonna forgive him when I went to his house and I said dad I said I really need to talk to you and I went in and I said, you know, what you did to me, you really destroyed my life. 
I said, Tracy is your son. And he said, you're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy just like your mother. And then he told me, um, do you know if you told the family this, what this would do to this family? And I'm sitting there looking at him saying, dude, do you realize what you've done to my life and all you can think about or worry about is the family? But I didn't say it because remember, I was still suffering in silence. Right, right, right. I hadn't broke my silence yet. So after he said that, I got quiet and I left out the door. He said, you need to leave. You need to leave. And I just walked out of the door and I never talked about it again for years. Oh, but I wow. I didn't realize that I was still, I didn't realize that I was still bitter. So it years was, before you told anybody, you did go and confront your father. They go and confront and tell See, and this husband. goes back to many times we do remember more than we tell, but we try to keep it blocked, right? But continue on. So after that, I told my dad, I said, um, it wasn't until I started going to therapy and my therapist was helping me to get in touch with where I was. And as I was going through my healing process, I realized that I did not like wearing pajamas. Mm. I would always find myself in sweatpants and t-shirts or jeans, and I would just fall asleep. I would ball up and fall asleep without putting on pajamas and it was because oh I would sleep in shorts and I would always want to sleep in clothes but pajamas just was kind of weird for me because I knew what would happen if I put on a nightgown you know I knew you know what would happen so I felt like I was giving him easy access mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I said you know what I need to release my father I need to release him so the only way I was able to release him was to come into his world. Meaning I thought about when he was a little boy, my grandmother had 14 children. Having 14 children, it's already hard trying to love three or four children. So can you imagine having 14 children in a house? There had to be some abuse there for my father to think that this was okay. Mm -hmm. I had to think about my childhood growing up and things that had happened to me as a kid. Something happened to my father and he never got the help that he needed. Right. And his world began to become darker and darker because there was no, he never tried to get any help. And then the drugs did not help. So he was doing these drugs because he was numbing some pain for some things that he needed healing for. This is how I came into his world and said, wow, I can only imagine what life was like for him as a kid. He never got any help to understand what he was doing. Now, I'm not saying I, I, I do not condone bad behavior, right? And I'm not going to make excuses for bad behavior by no means. But I had to come into his world as a kid for me to be able to forgive him and let him go. And once I was able to forgive him, I started praying for him, for God to have mercy on his soul and that God would allow him to change. And then as I began to go through this forgiving piece, I started writing letters. I didn't give him the letters. I just wrote them to get them out for me. Mm -hmm. And so I had to start writing letters telling him how much I forgive him. And then I would just get rid of him. I didn't give it to him, but I needed that freedom for myself. But it was almost like when I forgave him, it was like a heavy burden had lifted up off of my shoulders. And I could feel myself taking back all of my power because now after I started forgiving him and started releasing him, I started getting parts of me back. I was able to wear pajamas. I became a pajama junkie <laughs> I began to um, be able to speak up for myself. I began to tell people no, because 
he, I had relinquished that power to him. Mm -hmm. So this is why I wasn't able to tell people no. And this is why I was trying to people please people because I always wanted to please him. If right. I got a that you should have gotten an A. So I never felt like I measured up to nothing, you know? And right. so before that I started to forgive him, I started getting pieces back for myself. And you I know, was, it, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. And no, it's beautiful. And listening to you, it's like, what I hear you saying is by me seeing his humanity and his sin ridden state, bringing some understanding around that, what it did was, it plucked you outside of his world. You separated yourself from him. And I always said that I was in my father's back pocket and they make us commingle or meld with them. And so we don't even see ourselves separate. And I think it's beautiful how you actually just brought the design of forgiveness is truly to separate us from our abusers because we see us we see ourselves in the story commingled with them. We they've made it that way. They've made us believe this, but it, it, it separates us is what forgiveness does. That's you. And this is me. And I love, remember that you see you thing that I say. And, and I remember, I know it was an angel that sat down one day and wrote on this piece of paper, you see you Jody. And it's what you were just saying, because we're so focused on other people that God can't speak to us. God can't. And you just said, as I forgave him, I got pieces of myself back. So it allows us to separate ourselves from our abuser and it allows God to bring the focus on us. And it removes our focus from them because so often we see them with all the power and we just can't take our eyes off of them. I think it's a, a beautiful way to uh, look at the design of forgiveness. It really is to take our eyes off our abusers and just release them to the hands of God, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's beautiful. That's really that's that's really beautiful. Um, I want to read this one line in your book where you write about your son. Um, it's right here, and it, it, it's so beautiful. She says, My son taught me love in such a deep and profound way. I can say, My son is every image of me. He will give you the shirt off his back. If he sees you cry, he's going to cry with you. If he sees someone hurt, he wants to make them feel better. He's extremely funny and loving. So with our time now that we have left, Latarsha, thank you so much for this. I, I see us doing much more in the coming days and years. I just, I really believe that God has brought us together in this beautiful sister love. But Talk about um, your son, where you guys are today. I just like to open up this time um, because we could go on and on for hours. I could just talk to you forever, but I want to give it back to you and just honor your son. Um, he was a byproduct of this, but it's, I love that, that those tribute, the tribute that you gave to him, um, anything that you want to leave that maybe we didn't talk about that's important to you. If you want to talk to us about the work that you're doing today, you do conferences. I've seen you on the news. I'm just so proud of all the work that you're doing and, and God's strength be added to you. Um, just close us with any final words or anything that you'd like to say, but I did want to honor your son because he deserves that place. Thank you. It was, it was really hard, um, but he is, once I was able to forgive my father and heal, I was able to see my son as my son. And he's in a group home now. He, um, he has a TikTok and I, I'm putting this out there because he loves to be, to get center of attention. I he, love that. We will drop that in the information on the YouTube channel, by the way. TikTok, he has like 140,000 followers. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and his TikTok, his name is Everybody Loves Tracy. All right, and awesome. He's beauty TikTok. So if you need a laugh, go and look at his TikTok, Jody. Sometimes he has a really hard time. We put him in a group home because he got so aggressive at home. Yeah. And like 24 hour care. But, you know, he has weeks that he does really, really well. And his followers would be like, you know, what's going on with Tracy? And I didn't, I didn't post anything. And I said, I'm going to go live so that, because they, they love him. And I want them to be able to be in his world and understand, like he has some really hard times sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's just, sometimes it's so hard to see him have to go through the things that he go through because he's a product of this. 
right? right. And I just right. feel like I'm not deserving of this, but I do know that this, I know that God is moving because he's in a home now that he really loves. He loves being there. They do so many fun things and he's around people that is like him. And so he comes home, he, you know, comes home and spend the days with us. You know, once he get a level, he'll be able to stay overnight. They have a level system. But other than that, you That's know, awesome. he has a really good relationship. He adores me. He You're loves, his mama. You're his mama. <laughs> loves his mom. And the love that that boy gives me, it just melts my heart every time. You know, and um, he just, he is, he's such a beautiful person. He has such a beautiful spirit. And I'm just, I thank God for him, you know, I and I wouldn't change anything about it. You know, I just love my son and I love what he can bring to the world. And it's to put a smile on people's faces. And you know? right. He's a, he's a gift. He's your family. And you know what, as we've lost some family, God keeps our family by us. And I think about my girls and my grandchildren and they're our family, right? Latarsha. And we have, we do have family around us and God will even build that more. Thank you so much for being with us here today. And I'll see you next time on let's talk about it.